Alrighty, my friends, welcome back to the main stage here at MagicCon Las Vegas. You are in the right place for our next panel, the Studio X Q A. A full hour of your questions being answered by R&D insiders and other people from within the, uh, the building at Wizards of the Coast in Seattle. They're here joining us on stage to give you the answers that you crave, my friends. If you've got a question about the game, how it's made, anything else that's on your mind that you'd like answered by some of the people that are going to be joining us on stage, we've got uh, Aaron Forsyth, we've got Elaine Chase, Video Cut the Henna, and Melissa DeTora all coming out on stage to answer your, your questions. But before they arrive, I'd like you to join me in welcoming your host for this panel from Magic Social and Community Team. It is Trick Jarrett, everyone. Hello, hello MagicCon. Welcome to this Studio X Q&A. Thank you for coming out. Before we bring the panelists out, I wanted to ask a couple of quick comments, go over a couple of things about how we're going to do things. Obviously, there's a lot of people who love magic. We're excited. You all are excited to know more about how the game is made. When you come up and ask a question, there will be a microphone that will have a line. And please keep your questions concise. We want to avoid multi-episode encyclopedic questions, multi-chapters if possible. And also, um, we're going to do our best to answer your questions, but we're not the full company. We've got a great spread of people who work on making magic, but we aren't everyone. So you may be asking a question, and we might just not be the right people to answer them. We're going to do our best. We're going to have some fun. And with that, let's have our friends from the Magic Studio X come on out to take your questions for the Studio X Q&A. We have Aaron Forsythe, VP of R&D. We have Elaine Chase. VP of Player Experience. We have Ovidio Cartagena, the Senior Art Director, and Melissa DeTora, Senior Game Designer. Thanks for being here. All right, so if you would like to ask questions, the mic is over here. Please line up behind the mic stand, and we will be happy to answer your questions. First up, step on up, give us your name, and ask your question. All right, what's up? I'm, uh, I'm Frankster the Gangster. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, my question for y'all is, so for maybe about a year or two now, um, we've been reprinting a lot of cards, and a lot of cards we've seen have like gone down in value. Do we have a plan to like combat that, or are we just going to let all the good cards just go to eh, and then have actual good cards come up here? Well, Aaron, why don't we talk about the studio's thoughts on how products and product lines are made? Yeah, so we, we're trying to cater our products to a huge swath of folks. Um, and we've realized that these eternal formats, Legacy, Modern, Commander, where people can use cards from all of Magic or most of Magic are, are a huge part of how the game is played, uh, especially in tabletop. And we want to make sure that those game pieces are accessible to as many folks as possible. And at the same time, by putting those cards in products that we're selling now, whether you're through bonus sheets uh, or, or just inserting them into the sets in other ways or doing master sets or whatever, uh, you know, we can make sure that those, those front list products are relevant to players of all the different formats and not just for you know, standard and draft or whatever. Um, but yeah, we have heard this feedback for sure that there's some balance that we need to strike better of ease of access versus uh, you know, pride of ownership or, or, or whatever, where folks can feel like the cards they own are meaningful and uh, you know, are going to be worth what they paid for them or whatever. Um, so we have an economy team that looks at that stuff all the time and has been turning some knobs and telling us, hey, let's try a little more here, a little less here. Obviously. We work really far in advance, like a couple years in advance. So things we learn today uh, don't really get implemented immediately. They show up in products you know, 18 months from now or something like that. So the feedback has definitely been heard. Um, we're probably at a high point for doing this now. And in the future, you'll see it toned down a little bit. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next person, please go ahead and step up to the mic and uh, tell us your question. Hi, my name is Chris. Uh, my question has Get to closer do with... to the mic for us if you don't Hi, mind. my name is Chris. My question has to do with standard. Right now, the, healthy, uh, the health of standard is incredibly poor, especially when you're talking about paper magic. Before the pandemic, there was many people playing standard both in person as well as on arena. Right now, the only place you can find standard is arena. 
why it is the used to be the flagship event is no longer found anywhere. What is Wizards doing about trying to help make standard more appealing as well as uh, just more widely played? Understood. Elaine, what would you like to say about that? Um, yeah, I, I think we'll probably kind of double answer this because you brought up very truthfully that there's two aspects to making sure a standard is awesome. Um, one of them is, is the format fun to play? And then the second one is, do I have an opportunity to play it, right? Like, how meaningful is it? So I'll hit the opportunity bit, and then I'll hand it back over to Aaron for the is it fun to play bit. Um, so uh, first off, we believe that it is important to have a vibrant standard as part of what makes magic magic, right? Um, we did take a bit of a step back during the pandemic when you didn't have Friday Night Magic to go to every week, where we didn't have big events to go to every week. Um, and there was you know, a lot more play of Commander and at home and things like that. Uh, so actually, tomorrow, uh, Billy Jensen, our director of our play programs, is going to be doing a panel. And he's going to specifically talk about some things we're doing in the opportunity space to make sure our standard is meaningful and frequent everywhere from your local store up through competitive play opportunities. So I'm not going to scoop what he's talking about tomorrow, um, but I guarantee you, you'll hear more about both regular weekly standard play in store um, and how we're infusing standard into the competitive play, kind of premier play pyramid. OK? Aaron? I, is that a that's dragon? A dragon. <laughs> the dragon is roaring. Um, <laughs> you're right that the pandemic mattered a lot here in that um, I think people, the people that had a regular habit of playing standard in, in person in stores, when the, when, the pan, uh, when the pandemic hit, that's the format that kind of the, the chain broke. Uh, like your deck, would, if you, once you came crawling out of the darkness back into the store when the, when the quarantine was over, your deck wasn't legal anymore. Whereas your commander deck was, your modern deck was, all the, you could just jump back in and, and restart. Um, you probably started playing more on Arena during the pandemic. So, uh, you know, that habit shifted fully over into that sphere. So we, we do, it, is, it has been a tough nut to crack for us of how to kind of restart that activity. Um, when people are starting from nothing, they don't have a deck, they don't have, um, you know, they, they've changed their behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. The stores have started running different things. So, you know, we are going to, put some of these programs in place, try to incentivize it. We did not rotate this year. Like, that was a big change. Um, the metagame at Worlds right now, using this new three-year standard, looks pretty good to me. I'm, I'm very excited how that's turning out. And um, we actually saw this past weekend, when we look at our organized play numbers, that more standards been play, was played last weekend with the Wilds of Eldraine release than any week for the past several years since we switched over to Event Link. So, that change is meaningful. We think players like it, uh, especially tabletop players. And that's just kind of the first step. And like she said, Billy's going to talk more tomorrow about the rest of the plan. But there is, there is a plan, and you'll hear more about it shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing? Zach Clark from the Eternal Dirtles podcast. Um, the question I have is, uh, is really more based on the uh, next generation of game designers. And Magic is ostensibly a very analog game and a lot of a lot of resources are out there for digital game designers but if you're a guy like me who doesn't have much of a computer programming background uh what is wizards doing to kind of cultivate a more analog game designer uh career path a more analog game designer career path career path well i mean i would say within the building like the vast majority of our designers consider themselves primarily analog game designers. Um, we are, most of the company can work hybrid, work remote. Do, you know, since, since the pandemic, we've adopted that work style, but our game design teams are dedicated in the office all the time because we know just how much sitting around the table, physically manipulating the cards um, is important. We have good online play testing tools. When we have to use them, we can. We can test remotely and all that other stuff. We, um, but how you process information is, is very different in a physical space where you don't have tool tips or a mouse over or a tutorial at your hand. So we, we have to make things work well for 
people playing without all, without all the digital uh, accoutrement that, that you're used to from all the awesome video games that are out there now, including Arena. So we, you know, we're hiring folks that want to work physically, that want to work in the analog space, and you know, all of the work that they're doing has to work, you know, almost, I'd say 98% of the work we do is, is analog first, and that gets translated to digital. We do some stuff for Alchemy and, and whatnot on Arena, but that just basically is how we think of the game as we make it. It is, it is I'd say, a purely, purely analog experience. Like, Melissa can speak more to just how we, how we play or whatever that, that speaks to the, the physicality of, of, of how we treat the game. Yeah, we just play in real life all the time. You know, we're in the office most of the week. Uh, we build decks out of paper cards. Uh, we play with each other physically. Um, I think it's really important to um, actually play paper games of Magic as opposed to games of digital Magic. So you can actually like see the cards and play, kind of see like, oh, this is really hard to track. I can't do this anymore. You know, this is like too much material on the board, or like, or this is too much complexity. So like that's something that we really look for, which was like really hard to do during the pandemic, specifically with something like the day-night mechanic, where we play tested that only online. So we didn't really get a good sense of. Uh, how difficult this was to actually play in paper. So playing in real life is really important to us. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we take the next one in, uh, from the line, we did solicit some questions online from the community. I wanted to go from one of those. Uh, Aaron, uh, similar to that question, was the question submitted by a user named Umarali Fireseer, who asked, is there a possibility for players taking a hand in the design process in the future? If so, to what degree? So we do that a little bit. It, it's not. It's really difficult for us to do some kind of like open submission uh, web form or, or Discord thing where because there's just it, there's a lot of legal hoops to jump through for who you know who owns what that's been submitted and the, the time commitment of trying to s dig through hundreds or thousands of submissions like that is often not uh, as fruitful as time we could just spend doing the design work within our own team. We like running certain you know, promotions or things like that, if we make a you make the card kind of thing or whatever. But oftentimes, we will, you know, we'll bring in some folks as contractors. Like we brought in Sheldon Mennery, uh, who you'll be hearing more about tomorrow, I think, uh, to come in and work on a commander set for us. We brought in some uh, ex-pro players like Brad Nelson to come do some work on Modern Horizons 2 when I was leading that set. So, you know, whereas I don't think we're going to let the, the bulk of the universe contribute to a product. The, you know, if there are, are good thinkers uh, that stand out that, that want to contribute, we will, we will find ways to engage those specific individuals um, and, have them, and have them help out. We just did a play test at the last MagicCon with the uh, commander advisory group on, on, on a set of commander decks that won't be out for another year, and they gave us some really good input there too. So uh, we do... We do try to get the community involved uh, and, and, and get their input, but uh, you know, some, any kind of large scale activity is gonna be really hard to pull off. All right, thank you. Next in line, step on up, ask your question, please. Hi, everybody. We've seen a big expansion in the universes beyond content. I just wanted to ask, is it more or less challenging to work outside the, the normal magic universe for you guys? I couldn't hear that. Was it more or less challenging to, to work on the universes beyond outside of the normal magical okay. world. Why don't we start with Ovidia? Yeah, absolutely. What, what is it yeah. more or what? More, more or less challenging to work on UB than oh. magic. Um, <laughs> it, it depends. Uh, creating a magic card is a very complex task with many, many, many moving parts. There are parts that are easier, right? Like Gandalf almost writes himself, almost paints himself, but there's a lot of other things you need to fulfill, right? Like the, you need to fulfill fan expectations, even though we're, we're working off of books. Um, you think of uh, something like the, the very first stuff we did, the Godzilla stuff, uh, lots of rounds for accuracy, right? Like uh, Toho thinks of these characters as characters, right? And giving that approach to artists and, and thinking of them as individuals with individual features and not just, oh, this is a lizard and this is a moth and so on. Uh, it, it was a tough shift for, from the way we normally do things when we direct a creature. So uh, I, I'll say it's, uh, 
both are very complicated, but some parts are easier in each, and some parts are harder. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Alex. Um, I was interested with more and more um, products coming out with Commander deck specific cards with bespoke um, universes beyond cards like Street Fighter and things like that. Um, it seems like the studio is uh, churning through a lot more design space and I wanted to see how um, the studio is handling like that kind of economy in that making sure that the like amount of design space is uh, still uh, wide enough to make sure that magic goes on for another 30 years. You're, you're making sure we aren't yep. over, over digging into the resources yeah. of yeah, yeah. Yep. space. That's a great question. And you know, I'd say kind of during the middle of my career, I was super paranoid about exactly that. Like, I don't want to do too much. I don't want to use too many, too many new keywords in this set because that's some finite resource that eventually we're going to reach the bottom of. Um, but as we've broadened you know, the formats we're making cards for, as we've dipped into universes beyond, where like the, just the fact that we're putting some of these characters on cards makes them feel very different from you know, s mechanically similar cards that, that have a, a very different creative treatment. There's just a lot of axes that we have unlocked um, on how to make stuff cool and feel different and new um, beyond just keywords or, or, or game mechanics for sure. Um, and, you know, we, we can go back and, and tune things, and this one's kind of like this other mechanic from eight years ago, but so many people don't remember that one from eight years ago, or people that do are happy to see us bring it back. So everything doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel. Just we're creating more and more tools every time we make a new set that we can go back and pick the best ones from to combine into something new. Um, and, you know, the more I think about it, the plan all along was to be able to do this forever. And if there's infinite content, if I thought there's infinite content at a slower pace, there should still be infinite content at a, at a quicker pace. So I have, I personally have grown to believe that, you know, whatever, whatever pace we are asked to produce content at, um, given that the, the team has grown, like we have tons and tons of game designers, art directors, the art, my team has grown to embrace this, this new paradigm of how much stuff we're making, and they, they're doing an awesome job, and I believe there's no limit to the, to the new cool stuff we can come up with. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm going to go to another online question for a moment, and I'm actually going to ask Melissa this one. This comes from a user named Yellow Pie. Do you ever burn out or run into designer's block? And if so, how do you recover from it at working on design? Good question. Um, so for me, I don't really run into that very often. And um, because we're just doing so many different things and everything is very different from the next, like Universes Beyond is super different, super challenging, and there's always a new problem to solve. So I don't often get the designer's block, but people on my team often do. and. One thing that I do to combat that is um, I do read a lot of social media posts, Reddit, you know, uh, listen to podcasts, and get a bunch of ideas from the community. So your feedback really does matter is the point I'm trying to make here. And just think about what do these players want? Like, what are some cool new decks that they're building? And like, what kinds of cards do they want for their decks? So we're always looking for ideas like that. Great. Thank you. Next in line, come on down. <coughs> Hello. Um, Pioneer is one of my f is my favorite format, and one of the key things that me and um, all my other friends that love Pioneer is, is that it has that standard, I guess, like floodgate. Everything through Pioneer has to come through standard, and a big concern is that down the line there will eventually be Pioneer Horizons. I love Modern. I love Modern Horizons, but I do really enjoy the fact that Pioneer at its current stage only has standard as its entry method. Um, have there been any, any discussion, or what are y'all's opinions on that, of keeping Pioneer as stand, the cards have to go through standard to get into Pioneer? Um, that is currently a delimiter that we enjoy and, and, and plan on maintaining. Uh, we have 
another Modern Horizon set coming out uh, next year. We've talked about ones further beyond that for sure. Um, as long as we can keep doing it that way, that's how we're going to do it. Um, I don't know if that means for 20 more years or, or whatever. At some point, you know, Modern will be full of just like, <laughs> like the, the format will be incredibly powerful. Uh, there won't be a lot more designs that can be accommodated by the, the way the format's set up. Um, that could be a, a, a 10 years from now, it could be 50 years from now, I don't know. But we, we have talked about like what, what the, the pivot point would be where Pioneer would then graduate into the space that Modern used to occupy, and maybe we'd make another format that's the most recent eight years of cards. So, I mean, I do think there's a, a really slow tectonic movement of, of the position that these formats occupy. Um, like they're they're not all going to be exactly where they are now forever, um, but it will be. We will manage it slowly and cautiously. But uh, so I'm not going to say no. That'll never happen. But I mean, it is off off the horizon for a, a, a good long ways yet. Awesome. Thank y'all. Yeah. Thank you. Howdy. I'm William. I'm just asking. With standard moving to three years, does that change design in any way? So, Aaron, do you want to start with that one? Um, it does. It did not for Woe because we hadn't made the decision at the time when Woe was being finished. Um, but Woe has actually turned out pretty well, uh, given that that was not the target we were aiming at when we when we were putting it through play design. But yes, it does. There's a lot more. Um, a lot more pieces to interact with. And so we are trying to have the, the newer sets we're developing create more new decks as opposed to um, trying to add too much to decks that are already good. Um, so it gives us a lot more room to try out new things. Um, and we're hoping that if we, if we put enough new, new seeds out there, that some of them will be, enough, will be competitive with the stuff that already exists. Um, but it's, it's generally the same shape. Um, it's not like an eternal format where we're hoping for a card or two to matter. We still think large numbers of cards from each set are going to matter in standard when it's three years. Um, but it has proven uh, we, we did have to change our process slightly. OK. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much. Come on down. Next person in line. Hi there. My name is Jacob. Uh, as the father of two young kids, I was just wondering about like the the efforts or plans to kind of cater more towards the younger generation. Um, my house is full of uh, Paw Patrol and Bluey at the moment, though so there's not much interest in the magic at the moment, but as they get older, trying to introduce that to them or incorporate more of those interests. Um, I, I can jump in a little bit yeah. for yeah, kind of play opportunities, yeah. Um, I, I hope you've had the opportunity to walk around MagicCon, and I hope you've seen some youngins running around. Um, in fact, my favorite picture I've taken all weekend uh, was a, a, a family uh, that had a child. They were holding up to the dragon and in awe because <laughs> the dragon's pretty great. Uh, of course, the dragon then roared, and the kid was like, ah, but it, it's all fine. Um, so w one of the things we're trying to do here um, as kind of a first step, right, is be able to help encourage cross-generational play and make sure that all of us who are older and uh, love magic have a way to share it with our, our kids um, and bring them in. Uh, we've got a great program through Magic Kids who uh, helps get things out to teach people how to play magic and specifically younger. Um, and uh, one of the things that my team is going to be looking at uh, over the next you know, year or so is how do we find more ways to put magic in places where kids are? Uh, like schools and libraries and things like that, um, because uh, we we also would love to see a vibrancy of uh, you know a younger generation coming in enjoying magic. Um, I played magic with, with my daughter. Um, uh, there's many parents at Wizards who play magic with their kids, uh, and we we kind of feel that same way. From like an aesthetic standpoint, I don't think we're going to go all the way to Paw Patrol, like with any of our universes beyond stuff, anything like that. I mean, it, it's, it is kind of fascinating to think about some of these other huge properties, like say DC Comics, where they can have a movie like The Joker, and in the same, not, not the same canon, but the same IP, they have like Teen Titans Go or something like, like a cartoon that's for like six-year-olds. Um, do I think Magic could eventually have that entire gradient of stuff? I do. I don't think we're, we're there yet. Um, 
We are doing a lot of work now for a product that we think we're hoping to release next year that is like the best onboarding, best teaching, best like foundational way to play magic that we're hoping will work for, I'm not going to say, you know, five or six year olds by any means, but you know, the, the young, youngest audience we've ever tried to reach out to, the, the most newest audience we've ever tried to reach out to. So we are thinking about that, like growing the audience that way. Um, and maybe, you know, farther into the future there will be some kid's expression of either the product or the IP or something, but uh, that, that, that's still probably a ways off for us. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Obinio, I'm actually going to give you an online question real quick, and uh, it's from me, uh, from which you. is I have a cousin who's actually uh, an aspiring artist. He's All still right. in high school. Uh, what advice do you have for him as well as any other young aspiring magic artist? So the first advice I have for anyone who wants to become an artist, the first one, is don't listen to the haters. <laughs> Focus on getting good. Yep. There's the road to getting good is different for everyone because everyone has different talents, different interests, different obsessions. Uh, seek several advisors. Always have a group of people that advise you, artists and non-artists. That being said, be ready to be alone a lot of time. Making art is about sitting down or standing up and just holding that stylus, that brush, that pen, whatever you need, you need to master it. And mastering it takes hours and hours and hours, and you have to be ready. Because it gets lonely, right? It gets lonely, and uh, some friendships suffer, some relationships. So you need to learn how to manage that. That's very important. Um, and when you're on the other side, don't be afraid to come and show the work yep. to someone who can hire you. That's great. Thank you. All right, next in line, please step up. Uh, hello, my name is Phil, also of the Eternal Daughters podcast. I'm going to give a shout to the legacy community. Uh, the legacy community, or the legacy format rather, is the one format where uh, cards from the commander products can also be played in 1v1. And I was wondering what the knobs are, what the, essentially what's the process that goes on, if any, that balances cards that are played in four player versus cards that are played in 1v1, such as things like initiative and things like that, and the mechanics of designing for something where you expect it to survive three combat steps versus only a single turn cycle. What are the knobs that balance both commander versus 1v1 for specifically legacy, but in general as well? Aaron, you want to start this one? I or think this give is one from Melissa. Melissa, yeah. start us off. Yeah, I can probably take this one. Um, so first and foremost, these cards that are commander legal are for commander. And generally, um, it's OK if they hit legacy, but that's not the goal. So some things that we do to uh, make sure that things are balanced in legacy is first, we do have legacy experts in the building come in and uh, do a pass with the set and let us know, hey, if, if there's something up. Um, and if there is, maybe that's fine. Maybe it's, it's a cool card that'll add a lot of like, fun spice to legacy. Uh, other things that we think about are like, we actually like, take into consideration things like each opponent versus target opponent, you know, because Sometimes each opponent scales tremendously in commander, and it's like inappropriate, you know? So like, there are knobs like that that we look at all the time. Um, and another thing is commander cards are often played in cubes as well. So we do think about these cards in terms of like, hey, what if we want to put this in Magic Online on, on the Vintage Cube? Is this appropriate in that sense? And uh, casual constructed is usually played 1v1. So these are things that our team is thinking about all the time of like how to balance commander versus 60 card. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in and say, I think you brought up the initiative. Um, that was one I don't think we had our heads around for for one on one, one, uh, one v one legacy. Like, I just don't think that was on our radar as how that was going to play out. Like, we had thought about other cards in that product, like Minsk and Boo, I think, you know, is really powerful with a pretty cool card. And we, we had understood that that was going to probably be good enough to show up in older formats. But yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, when you're not thinking about a problem, you don't think you need to solve it. And how initiative played out beyond the commander draft format of, of, of Baldur's Gate and then how it would be used building actual commander decks, there was not, that was not, um, I think that one just slipped by us, honestly. Oh, I just want to say we greatly appreciate all the work that you do. Thanks Thank so much. you. Thank you very much. Come on down next in line. Hey, how's it going? 
Uh, my question is kind of regarding going towards other IPs and everything like that. Is there, kind of you touched it on it before by saying you wouldn't kind of go down the Paw Patrol route, things like that. Is there any IPs that you guys are really trying or looking forward to working on or would really love to work on? And also, do you guys have in mind, where do you draw the line of this just wouldn't work? Well, for the first half, I want to compliment you on trying to get us to leak future deals. 100%. <laughs> but we're not going to answer that part. Would anyone like to tackle the second part about what, you, what, what sort of stuff we look for? Like, where's the line of something we don't think is a good where's fit the line for magic? For, uh, yeah. for, for what UB, feels like for magic? For UB, yeah. Oh, uh, listen. I'm an artist, so I, I draw the line, right? <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, I, I think it... There's, there's several angles you can take. I, it's very hard for me to say, this is where we're just not, like, we've done a lot of things, and they end up working pretty nice, even against my expectations. There's a lot of stuff that I'm very surprised by the work people are doing. It's, um, I can tell you that the experiences I've had throughout the sets I've done have opened my mind to what is possible in magic. And what that means is I hope fans feel the same because there's a lot of cool stuff coming, uh, stuff I've never seen before, and uh, ways that we can understand magic that we didn't thought were possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I was one of the kind of originators of the whole universe is beyond idea. And I, when I first pitched it, I had a line. And since then, we have made things that are, were past my line because other people talked me into it or, or you know, were really passionate about doing it. So the line is not a hard one. I think if there's a case to be made for, no, this can be really fun, this will work out, we'll try it. Like, I don't know that any of us thought we'd be putting Jeff Goldblum on a magic card back when we started. And then we showed it off yesterday, and the, the, the audience loved it. So it's like, OK, we're on to something here. There's something cool here. Um, and as far as is there stuff we want to do, Yes, there is. Uh, the future is very exciting for Universes Beyond. That's all I'll tell you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Next up, let's hear what you got to say. Hello. My name is Kendall. Uh, my question is kind of generally along the lines of power creep. Like, do you guys have a way that you measure that? Or how much do you think about that when you're designing a new set? Just something along that line. Yeah, what can we how, talk do you, about? how do you think about it? How does that influence your design space? Sure. Sure. Um, let's see where to begin with this one. Um, we do think about power creep a lot. So what I do is, uh, like, so I primarily um, make cards for Commander these days. Um, so there's a lot of old cards from the past that I compare cards to all the time. Um, so some things that I ask myself when I'm looking at a card that is power creep is, uh, what is the card that this is compared to? Is it a card that people like? Is it a card that people really hate? Like, if they hate it, we generally don't want to power creep on it because then it's going to result in a card that nobody likes. Um, is it a card that is, like, popular? Or if it's, like, a really cool card but maybe not that popular, maybe the card needs to be power crept a little bit. So, you know, I just, like, go through, like, you know, make a lot of comparisons, look at historical examples, and just ask myself, is the card fun? Um, but we are also very mindful of, of power creep, and we don't want to creep too hard. So, like, we find the line, and we might go a little bit past the line, but, like, definitely not far past the line, um, because we are trying to make magic forever. So we do need to keep power creep in mind. Otherwise, uh, the game is going to get out of hand. Yeah, yeah obviously, we, we, like I said earlier, we want to do this forever. And if we were power creeping, at some ridiculous rate, we would, we would run out of stuff to make. Um, like, I'll, I'll talk about Ragavan, just because I worked on Modern Horizons 2, and like what the impetus for making that card in the first place was. Like, power creeping on things that people don't play, I feel like is very inbound. If it's like an effect or a card is just not played in any format, why not try to make a slightly better version of it to try to uh, you know, open up that space for something that people will put in their decks? There, there were no like one mana two ones in red that were good enough to play in modern when we were working on Modern Horizons 2. That was just not a 
they're, you know, Seder, Fire Drinker, whatever, they're, name them, you list them off. None of those cards was getting played. So it's like we need to make one better than those if we want that kind of card to show up. Ragavan probably went a half step beyond what it needed to, but the, the, the impetus was like, I would like people to have little red aggressive creature that they can play that's worth playing given Ren and Six exists, given Lava Dart exists, given, you know, Plague Engineer, whatever, all these very hostile to one toughness creatures cards. So we needed to make a one toughness creature a lot more powerful than it would have been previously. So and, and another recent example is like there's a instant speed divination in, in Wilds of Eldraine that, you know, people decided to tweet about for a day. Like divination, I think, showed up in one good standard deck once in its entire existence, and we've printed it a dozen times. So I think make, do, we have made other versions of divination that's better. So I think an instant speed one is very in bounds. Like we would like to get this effect good enough to consider people playing it and constructed. And so that's one one way to turn it. And I even think like we will go back and we will print divination again at some point in the future. Old divination, sorcery speed divination. That space is not closed off forever. But we're just hoping to try to turn the knob so that thing that wasn't good enough is now good enough. I think it's worthy of complaint when it's like, this card was already amazing and you made a better version of it. Like that, that is certainly something we try not to do or, or really, you know, um, that's never our goal because we do want, we'd rather expand what you can do in Magic where there is some power creep that contracts what you can do in Magic because it invalidates tons and tons of stuff. We want to open up more things you can do by taking things that weren't quite good enough and making good enough versions of those things. That was awesome answer on both accounts. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Come on up. How are you guys doing? My name is Derek. I'm from Florida. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to Mike and Sally at the Dragon's Lair. <laughs> and I actually have a really fun question for everyone on the panel, because I know you guys have been on the panel for a collective experience for a long time. So my question was, is for each of you, what's your favorite card you had a hand in designing, Okay. like of all time? Who would like to start this one off? I can start. Melissa, get, get us started. All right. So mine is Tovalar from Midnight Hunt. And the reason why I picked this one is because players have been asking for a werewolf commander. And last time, we gave them a not very powerful one, and nobody liked it. So I wanted to make sure that when we were making Tovalar that we delivered on a werewolf commander that people wanted to play. So for this process, I built a werewolf commander deck and play tested it until I figured out what is, the, what is the design that players are going to be excited for? And then now we have Tovalar. Yeah. Um, so I don't get to design a ton of cards, right? But I get to do proposals. And actually, it's, it's good that you asked that today and not maybe a year <laughs> ago. Because today I can say my favorite card that I had a hand in, the design, a soft hand, was um, the Watley card we previewed yesterday the double-sided Watley saga, because it, that's something that Miguel and I were talking about. We're saying, no, th this needs to be very flavorful. And we saw what was done with the Praetors. So we wanted to give that to Watley as a poet. It felt very flavorful and just really resonant with the character. And it gave us the chance to put a lot of cool imagery in there. Elaine? Um, I'm going to talk about, I was on the original Kamigawa design team, uh, and that set was extraordinarily challenging because we were coming off of some broken sets before it, and so our power level had to be pretty tightly constrained. Um, and the whole concept of it was something that was very different for the time. Like We based it around this storytelling with legends, and Commander didn't exist. So who cared about all this stuff, right? Like it was, it was a very interesting and challenging design. Um, and we had actually gone back to the drawing board like completely, like multiple times. Um, and we hit some point in the design where we're like, OK, look, like we see how all these legends interact with each other. We see how this is coming together. But like what we were missing was like these just like star players that like regardless of everything else, we thought players would just love and make an impact. Um, and so uh, we locked ourselves in a room, and in one day, we designed the five dragons. Like, we just locked ourselves in a room, and we're like, this is it. This, this is the thing that's going to lock. We're going to make these, these, we're going to make dragons, one for each color. And that, like, literally, we did that in a day, and we tested them and everything. But, like, we locked ourselves in a room to do that. Um, and looking back, and, like, what 
that set and those dragons in particular became, you know, for, for Magic and players, that's something I'm really proud of. I love Yose. What a yeah. mean, mean card. <laughs> um, you asked me this question. I would answer this question, you know, differently every week. But I'll say right now, I guess Grist the Hunger Tide from Modern Horizons 2 is a card that I, that line of text of like, this is a 1-1 one, one creature in every zone other than the battlefield took a lot of convincing of the rules team and even the commander uh, rules committee that this was worth putting on a card because it was so strange. Um, but it's worked exactly as I'd hoped. Like, that, that matters. And, like, people are comboing it with cards that, like, Ether Vial or Collected Company or whatever that cares about it's a creature, and you get a Planeswalker that way. Uh, and it's just, it was very flavorful for the, the character that was just made out of insects. Um, it was, I thought it was really clever, and it turned out exactly as I'd hoped. And I'm sure Trick has an answer for this one, too. <laughs> I, I appreciate your recognition of the two cards I have credit <laughs> for over my time at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, I mean, my answer would be Alpine Guide from uh, uh, Modern Horizons, which uh, the fun story I have is that that card was a card that I tried to get made uh, for like six years. It was just one I kept submitting and throwing in there as Trick's Goblin. And uh, Ethan Fleischer took a liking to the idea and it was originally in his Trix Goblin. He put it in there, and then Studio messed around with it and changed it to Trix Constellation Prize when they tweaked the card away from my original design. And then it was Trix Parking Ticket, uh, <laughs> and it kept, kept going through these iterations of names until it stopped being a goblin altogether and ended up becoming the Alpine Guide in, in uh, Modern Horizons. So, yes, thank you so much for the question. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Come on up. Hey, everyone. Uh, I've been playing Magic for a long time, specifically I played Modern, and with that I've seen a lot of bannings over the years. Um, but one thing I haven't seen as much is unbannings. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the thought process or the discussion that goes into unbanning cards in various formats. Yeah, Aaron, why don't you talk about some bannings and unbannings? Yeah, we talk about this a lot. Like we went round and round on a bunch of stuff when we landed on a, what was it, Preordain that came off the list just this last time. Um, of just like risk reward, and we know players would like you know some of their old toys back. Totally get the, the 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 desire for that, especially as the format has gotten more powerful. Like some of this stuff has to be okay, right? Um, but we're in a weird. It's, it's kind of a weird devil's deal where it's like, okay, we could either unban punishing fire. I'll use that as an example. It's when we get talk, we talk about a lot. We can unban punishing fire, and it won't matter because it won't be good enough. Or we can unban it, and it's going to be good and miserable the same way it was miserable the, the first time. Like, what is the victory condition here that we're trying to, trying to land on? Um, you know, Splinter Twin is one that uh, I've got a guy who tweets at me every single day of his life to unban. When it, you know, it's day 275 of me asking for Splinter Twin to be unbanned. I mean, I imagine someday we'll get around to that and have that discussion in earnest and figure out that, like, okay, W w the, the format's changed so much that this is okay now. But it, it, it's often like if something's wrong with the format, we want to address what's actually wrong with it, and that's usually a particular card th that we just printed or, or a deck that has just come out of the woodwork and is, and is, a, is, a, is a, something that needs addressed. Or the, there, or the format's fine, and we didn't w don't want to risk like polluting it with some old problem that we knew you know, um, we had to deal with the first time around. I think we're probably a little too conservative. There's probably some, some more cards with, I don't know, Artifact Lands or... or uh, there's a couple other ones that, that are at the top of people's lists. Like we, we do have a list and we stack rank how safe we think they are. Um, so I, I'd say that we'll probably pick it up a little bit in the next couple of years. It won't, there's not going to be any kind of, let's open the floodgates and bring back Birthing Pod and all of the nonsense from uh, a few years ago. But you know, here and there, we'll look, for, we'll look for some more spots to do that stuff. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to take another question from, my, uh, from the online, and this one will go from Melissa, which is, a Commander is the largest of Magic's casual formats, but what other casual for formats or ways of playing do Studio X design for or think about? What other casual formats yes. do you think about? All right, so we design uh, for Limited. That's like one of the major formats we design for. And um, that's actually like an experience that most casual players have. Like, they might go to their local store, buy 10 packs or something, open those up, build a deck. Or maybe go to a store, buy a couple of packs, add them to their existing deck. So I think most players interact with Magic in that way, where they're only, like, buying 
a handful of packs, maybe a booster box, and building a casual deck out of that. So when we play, when we play test limited and we balance limited, um, if the limited experience is very fun, then that kind of translates to the casual experience. So yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is limited is like a really important part of balancing for casual. And uh, we try to make sure limited is fun. So this way, the 60-card uh, casual kitchen table player will have a good experience if they interact with the set. Awesome. Thank you. Next in line, go ahead and step forward. Hello. Um, I have a question about switching to the one set model. Uh, the first uh, article that Mark wrote for the year in review that, that addressed that said that some of the concerns were the, the lack of cohesion and overlap across the sets and that that was a lesson learned that you'd be working on. I mean, with how far you work in advance on sets, where do you feel you are in that and about like how much sooner before we see a stronger cohesion across sets? Yeah, we, we are definitely very far in one direction on that right now where each set is as different as possible almost as it can be from the set before and the set after it, both mechanically and flavorfully. Um, and we have had some conversations recently about it's probably too far, right? It's, people get invested in a certain type of deck or a, a new mechanic comes out and they wish there was more coming that could help flesh that out. A good example would be uh, Rosewater and I just talked last week about wouldn't it have been great to have some more toxic features in March of the Machine to, to follow up on, on Phyrexia. So I think there's ways to get all of the good stuff of like a new world and a new creative and a new cast of characters and keep some mechanical through lines from either the previous set or the, previ the two sets before or something like that, where it's not just literally a uh, brand new crazy thing every single time. Because I do think magic's more fun when your cards do combine and work together in cool ways. And um, so definitely on our minds. Uh, you'll see a little bit of that stuff happening, I'd say, in the next year or so, as, as we've learned the lessons from doing it this way uh, over the past year. Uh, but yeah, I, I, think we're, I think we're too far, and we, we can find a better middle ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, while we think that, Elaine, I wanted to ask you, you know, I introduced you as the VP of Player Experience. Can you just give us a general idea of what that, I mean, you've talked a lot about store play and interacting with the fans, but what does your job actually encompass as that role? Yeah, so the... Um the way I like to phrase it, I don't even know if Aaron's heard me say this, but the way I like to phrase it is Aaron's in charge of the magic and I'm in charge of the gathering. Um, <laughs> right, there you go, that works. Um, so my team, uh, my team put on this show, so I hope you're enjoying yourself. Um, yeah. I hope, yeah, all right, good, good, thank you. Um, uh, so the, the kind of the heart of my team is based off of, you know, what was previously the organized play team or the esports team. Um, and uh, what we really do is try to help people find their gatherings, like that is what our mission is. And so that expands everything from how do we bring new people into the fold? I talked about, you know, you know, school programs and things like that before. Um, how do we make sure that your local game store is like a, a cornerstone of your magic experience and, in, 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 you know, for you and your local community there? How do we make sure that we have opportunities for players around the world to take that first step for aspiration of, you know, really challenging themselves? up that competitive play ladder? Um, and how do we make sure that we reach people who don't want to play competitively or 1v1, who really see magic as a way to hang out with a group of friends, whether that's at a store or at home or in a restaurant or whatever, um, at, at IHOP maybe, if you stop by the IHOP booth down there. Um, and it's really about magic means different things to different people. And how can we make sure that however you want to enjoy magic, there is a place for you to gather and a community for you to be a part of. That's great. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Next in line. Oh, oh my God. I just lo I love that answer. I, I kind of want to ask a different question. Now. <laughs> can, can I come back around to, ask, to follow up with yes. the question later? Yeah. Sweet. OK. Hi. Um, I'm Maurice, and I have a bit of an industry question for you. Uh, so I'm a product designer at Geocaching. And Geocaching is a real life treasure hunting game. And my game, like yours, is very tactile. It's analog. It's physical. It's really hard to just get some play testers sometimes, right? Just recruiting and getting the right people in the room and scheduling. And um, 
I, I kind of want to follow up on what you said before, where after the pandemic, you had to figure out how to do that in a digital environment. So I'd like to ask you, like, what tools or methods or processes do you use in your team to make that easier? I think so Aaron when is the cool. pandemic hit us, we were pretty blindsided by that. And we were using like really archaic, terrible, frankly, uh, playtesting tools. We had people trying to cobble stuff together. One of our intrepid game designers, uh, a fellow named Yanni Skolnick, built a way to draft uh, using Excel macros, um, <laughs> where, where you'd have tabs for each player at the bottom of the spreadsheet. And it, if I picked <laughs> the card, it would then populate your spreadsheet with what was left in the pack. Uh, we, had, we have since uh, built a very robust simulator of tabletop magic that we use uh, you know, that can do all of the, the card mechanics. It can import files directly from our database uh, and whatnot. But we still struggle. Um, you know, there are people that still work remotely, and they're like, how can we contribute? Uh, I don't know, there was even a point where we were playing Commander on PowerPoint or something like that, right? <laughs> Everyone had their own, like, we had a shared PowerPoint document that you would drag card images onto. Um, so there was a lot, of, a lot of scrappiness during the pandemic, a lot of trial and error that eventually led us to good tools that, funny enough, we don't need as much right now, but we're ready for the next virus, uh, whenever that comes around, for, to, 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 to make magic please, the please way we no. want to. No, please, I get, no, no, no. We don't want that. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, just, we, like I said earlier, it has just been a, a kind of a tenet of our team that we, we need to be replicating the player experience as much as possible, being face-to-face, -face, interacting, seeing how people react physically to the cards we're playing, seeing how, what it's like physically to have to track all of the information that we're expecting you to do in the game. And that's the only way we know we're going to keep making it uh, feel authentic, that we could be working remotely, we could be working digitally, but that's just not, no not what we expect our consumers to do. So we're not going to do it ourselves either. Awesome. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, like, I enjoy geocaching, by the way. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you all so much for all the incredible work you do on the best game ever made. Um, and secondly, I wanted to say, do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into game design? And also, how did you find yourselves at Studio X? Yeah, we touched on this slightly a little bit earlier, Aaron, but why don't you uh, talk about some advice for getting into game design? Yeah, there's a couple. I mean, we have, we have internships that we're hiring in, you know, students from actual game design programs in local universities and whatnot. Uh, some of those have turned out into full-time employees that are on my team. That's kind of the most, what I'd say, traditional, what you'd expect, how you'd expect to become a game designer. Honestly, though, 90% of the people on my team, that is not the path they took. I personally didn't take that path. My degree is in chemistry. Um, I did not expect to be doing this when I was a younger man. But when you fall in love with magic, there's a lot of ways to become to get noticed. Uh, writing stuff on the internet, creating content, um, even on even some social media posts. We we've looked into some people who just write very intelligent social media posts about some of our limited formats or whatever, and reached out to them about, hey, would you consider applying for jobs here or whatever. Uh, we have the great designer search where we will solicit submissions from fans to try to run them through a ringer and see which ones can make it through the gauntlet of design challenges. That's, so we've probably got a half dozen people in the building that came through that way. Um, and then the last one is just if you can get in the building at all, whether you're working in fraud or customer service or technology or whatever, come on by the studio. You know you can chip in, you can get into some play tests. We'll put you on a commander team, we'll put you on a, a, in, in a, on a set team to help out if you've got a few extra hours during the week. And that's how I, got. I was hired in as a web, a, you know, web content creator. I was not a game designer when I got to Wizards and I made my way into the studio that way. Um, so, you know, we're looking for passion and talent everywhere it exists. Uh, but you know you have to try to stand out somehow, stand out somehow from the crowd. You know, there's this, this building is full of thousands of people that love magic. Like, why are you the one we we, we want to to bring into the building? Um, but yeah, there's there's many varied paths to get into into game design. Hey, Trick, do you want us to kind of talk about how we got into 
into wizards or how I got into wizards? No, how do you want us to talk about yeah, how we please. got into wizards? Okay. Sure. Um, so I, I'm I'm gonna kind of lean from there and, and talk about something you said earlier, which yeah. is a little bit of like whatever it is you want to do, like just do it. Like that's the baseline ex kind of career advice I give to anybody who's looking to be anything. Like if you want to design cards, design cards. If you want to be an artist, draw. If you want, like whatever it is you want to do, like start doing it because that's how you get better at it. Um, and make sure you have people along with you on your journey who can give you feedback, which is exactly what you said before. Um, but yeah, like the vast majority of people who work at, you know, in, in the kinds of jobs you think you'd want to have here, like, like there wasn't a school for game design when I went to college. My degree is in elementary education. Um, and uh, I also studied theater. Uh, a lot of my play team has a theater background because, you know, a lot of the things you do in theater help go down a show like this. Um, but like really, it's just, you know, I, I got in because uh, I, I played on a couple of pro tours, but I was terrible at playing on a pro tour. Um, but I was a really good judge and tournament organizer. And my first job at Wizards was just on the DCI helping to run tournaments because that's what I did in the public. Um, and that's kind of how I got my way in. And I leveraged that into playing in the Future Future League and being able to contribute that way. And that let me move onto the R&D team, right? And so like that kind of pathway, as Aaron said, is really typical and normal. Uh, yeah, so that's a lot of the same advice I have. But um, one of the artists, Eric Wilkerson, told me something. He said, I didn't get noticed until I did a painting for myself. So he did something, he, he was making stuff he loved for his own person. And of course, this, this, is, this is a great talented person. So, but that passion that you put into the thing, people are going to see it. You just make sure that you put it out there so that others are able to, to, to see what you're doing. I, uh, I got into Wizards as a digital artist. And I, I worked with the great Jess Lanzillo, who helped me out. And eventually, I got into Art Direction. And um, I'm, very, I'm very grateful. I'm very happy. But it's, it's important that, that you are seen. And, and, and that you, whatever you're doing, you do it with passion. And the best way to get started is to do something that you see, that you haven't seen, that you would love to see made in the world. And then, getting the right people to look at it. Melissa? So I got to Wizards through the Pro Tour, which I think is the hardest way to get hired at Wizards. <laughs> and I didn't know a thing about game design, but I knew how to build magic decks. I was good at power level evaluation, and I had magic play skill. So that's how they gave me a shot. Um, it's, again, very hard, but um, it's possible. So if you are a pro tour player who is looking to get into Wizards, what I recommend is learn how to talk about cards, learn how to communicate really well, and play lots of magic and build lots of decks and just keep at it. And uh, we have recruiters go to pro tours to uh, talk to players if they're interested. And yeah. that's it. That's about it. That's how I got in. And it's important to say that we're just five people on this stage. Wizards is hundreds of people who all have different journeys, all have different stories. Like, very few people get to Wizards through the same path as the person before them or next to them. So uh, we, we look forward to anyone who's interested and excited in helping make magic better. And uh, that's the key to helping get inside the doors at Wizards. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. We do have only a few minutes left. We're going to take a couple more questions, but I just want to manage expectations that we are starting to get close on time. Perfect. Okay. My question is, what is your favorite thing that you've done that you feel has improved the magic experience? Favorite thing that you've done that has improved the magic experience? I'll jump in. Uh, Elaine, please. Friday Night Magic is modeled after how I played magic before I joined Wizards. I am not the only person who contributed to bringing Friday Night Magic to life, but it is that, that's what it's based on. Um, and. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that so many people love magic and can play it the way I did. That's a pretty strong one. Yeah. Anyone else want to sh share their favorite? Uh, I think for me, it's a commitment to what I call resonance of design, uh, where we're you know, designing to bring concepts to life as opposed to just coming up with what's the most 
interesting rules text from uh, moving cards around zones or whatever. But like, I want to make a card that feels like a giant hornet. So that's the words I'm going to write. Like, that was not how cards were designed when I got here. And that just felt very wrong to me. Um, that like, I want my cards to be things and feel like things, not just be math problems. Um, so, and I, you, you can see, you know, I think the first Zendikar, the first Innistrad, Magic 2010, and all the and universes beyond is just an, another outgrowth of wanting to do this as much as possible. Just make the cards feel like the things that they represent. You know, work really closely with the creative team when we're doing design and come up with a holistic thing. So that's my favorite. Over here, Melissa, you have quick ones to, to add to that? Um, so mine is I help change the process in how we design cards for Commander. Um, I think it resulted in a lot of excellent Commander cards, like really cool decks. So yep, that, that's what I'm proud of. Great. I'm just really proud of uh, the, the efforts in the world building team. We've, we've made a lot of strides in representation and inclusivity. Uh, there's, there's so many names that have done great work, some of them sitting here today. And, uh, and I've been a part of that. And I'm, I'm just very proud to help make the game welcoming for more and more people every day. And uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff coming. And I, I hope you keep an eye out for it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll take one more question. And then we're going to wrap this panel up. So step on up. Hey. Um, as designers, I'd like to ask you guys, what would you like to see or where would you like to see magic in five to 10 years? Is there any changes or just anything in the game that you want to see in that time? Melissa, do you have a thought on five years, what you'd like to see? Off the top of my head, no, but maybe I'll take a minute to think about it. <laughs> How about you, Aaron? I mean, obviously, we're just trying to get more and more people engaged and involved and wanting to try it out without sacrificing why it got here in the first place. So, you know, we know the game's deep and robust and, and hard in very fulfilling ways and complicated in, 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 in ways that really, you know, tickle the brain. So we don't want to throw any of that out as we try to expand who, is it, who wants to try this or whatever the stigma is about why you didn't want to get into magic. Can we remove that and break down some of those barriers? So. That's just kind of the constant quest of like, I know this game would appeal to even more people if they just gave it a chance. What do we need to do to get them to do that? So that's always front of mind for me. Yeah, at the end of the day for me, it's really about more players playing more magic, right? Like that's, that's just it, right? For me, I mean, magic is such a fundamental part of you know, who I am and, and what I do. Um, but the way I experience magic isn't the way everyone experiences magic. And what we're really striving to do is make sure there's a way into magic for, for more and more people and more and more different kinds of people and different kinds of experiences and make sure that they get anchored with a community that's supportive and welcoming um, that allows them to you know, in, enjoy magic the way they want it to be and be their authentic selves and make magic a cornerstone of who they are, right? Whatever that is. It's all about the gathering. All about the gathering. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for answering questions. Thank you to the question askers. And thank you all for attending MagicCon Las Vegas. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. In 30 minutes, this stage will play host to the cosplay contest, including the grand yep. finals Woo! of our cosplay contest from our MagicCon so far. So don't go anywhere, but thank you all for attending this panel and have a great weekend. <laughs>